All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the um, the ontology of open access, the historian's guide from manuscript to monograph to reception and impact presentation today. Um, I'm your technical host for the event, Teresa Schmidt, and you will be hearing more from um, our lovely panel uh, chaired by Elizabeth Demers um, and including Beth Belucos, Beth Food uh, and Heather Staines. Um, very quickly, I'm going to give an overview of the uh, Zoom features for today's panel. Um, so your audio and video are all muted. When we get to the Q&A portion later, though, you can unmute to ask your question if you would like to. There will be other ways to ask your question. But if you wanted to be unmuted, um, you would request this by raising your hand through the little button uh, that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, the You'll be able to see the slides on screen throughout the presentation and whoever is talking at the moment. Um, chat and Q&A are enabled. If you have any technical issues, you can let me, uh, Teresa Schmid, know in the chat. You'll be able to select that. If you lose your connection to Zoom, you can email me. My email is T-H-E-R-E-S-S-C at umich.edu. I can drop that in the chat too. Um, and um, get that going. And the webinar will be recorded, as I said earlier. Um, for the chat, just a quick review. You can use this for discussion. Um, throughout the webinar, um, the chat button should be on your screen and you can select um, specifically who you want to send your chat to. You can choose to send it just to the panelists. Like if you have a issue with your, um, you know, seeing the webinar or something else just for our attention, or if you want to do a general discussion, you would select all panelists and attendees um, for your chat. And then for the Q&A, this would be the best way to queue up any questions that you have during the webinar for the Q&A portion at the end. Um, you can send it anonymously, or if you leave that box unchecked, um, it will uh, display whatever name you're logged into Zoom with. Um, and you can use this to ask your um, questions and we'll have them queued up through the presentation. Um, and if it's, um, at the very least address them at the end, but that also gives us an opportunity to possibly work them in. Um, I think I see somebody has raised their hand. So I'm gonna look, see if I can spot that. Um, Amy Middleman, um, I'm gonna reach out to you um, just to see if I can help you out. Um, and again, the raising hand we can use um, later in the, um, presentation when we get to the Q&A. So without further ado, I am going to route this over to Elizabeth Demers. Thank you so much and good morning and thank you for attending the Ontology of Open Access, the historian's guide from manuscript to monograph to reception and impact. My name is Elizabeth Demers. I'm the editorial director at University of Michigan Press. I'm also a historian by training. The University of Michigan Press and Michigan Publishing are delighted to sponsor this virtual AHA session on open access publishing for scholars at every stage of the research life cycle, authors, readers, researchers, publishers, and funding. And the University of Michigan Press has a robust history of publishing open access academic scholarship via our fulcrum platform, as well as Muse, JSTOR, OIPEN, Kindle, and more. Teresa, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. These are a few of our recent OA titles. These have been supported by Tome, Shimp, which is the um, Sustainable History Monograph pilot, uh, the Mellon Foundation, Knowledge Unlatched, the NEH, and by other private funders. Teresa, can you hit the next slide? And in addition to traditional print titles, the University of Michigan Press offers open access monographs alongside restricted access eBooks via the UMP EBC eBook collection. During the pandemic, we offered the eBook collection free to read globally and the growth in usage globally was astounding. And this image shows what happens to usage when monographs are free to read. Next slide. Our speakers this morning bring a wealth of knowledge and experience in scholarly communication writ large, as well as more specifically in history monographs, both open access and traditional and restricted access formats. So it's my very big delight to introduce our first speaker, who's Heather Staines. She's currently an independent consultant in the scholarly communication space. 
Her prior roles include head of partnerships for Knowledge Futures Group, director of business development of Hypothesis, as well as positions at ProQuest, Sipix, Springer SBM, and Greenwood, Greenwood Publishing Group Prager Publishers. She is a frequent speaker and participant at industry events, including the Counter Board of Directors, the Charleston Library Conference, the STM Future Lab, Society for Scholarly Publishing, the NISO Transfer Standing Committee, the NASIG Digital Preservation Committee. Whew, that's a lot. Uh, Heather is multi-talented. She has a PhD in military and diplomatic history from Yale University. Heather. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I've been in the scholarly communication space for a while and I don't get to talk to uh, or with historians as often as I would like. So um, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be a part of this panel. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is just to give a brief overview introduction to open access books. I'm a little intimidated by the uh, attendee list because we have so many experts um, also joining us. Uh, so please do um, chime in uh, for, for anything that I missed. It's meant to be a really basic um, overview to kind of kick us off um, as our other speakers will, will dive in a little bit uh, on their uh, particular projects. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the state of open monographs uh, today? And when I, and I'm really, you know, looking at the, the humanities and social science space. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to report that there are so many of them. Um, the growth of, of open monographs um, in recent years and the experiments around them um, have, have really taken off. Although I, I would say a lot of education, you know, is still needed. So if you're not aware of, um, of this, uh, uh, this trend, um, hopefully you'll learn a lot more today. They live in so many places across the web. And one of the unique things about open books are that they do tend to be hosted on multiple platforms, which will lead to some, some challenges uh, down the line um, as we will address. They follow um, many different models. Uh, some, again, some of them you'll hear about today. Elizabeth mentioned a few, um, the Tome Project and the, and the Sustainable History Monograph Pilot. Um, and it's wonderful because the experimentation uh, you know, en enables uh, many different scenarios, many different levels of participation, um, as you'll see. Um, these open monographs also push the boundaries of what we may, uh, back in the dinosaur days when I was in grad school, have considered books uh, at all um, with, with interactives, um, with living books, uh, with all sorts of um, you know, ever-growing uh, kind of corpuses of material, and that is, is really interesting to see evolve. Um, they may defy conventional infrastructure. So when we talk about the, the um, distribution channels that many publishers um, typically turn to for their books, uh, a lot of these open monographs, because they can be so experimental, do need uh, specialized infrastructure to enable uh, authors to build them out as fully as they would like and readers to enjoy them uh, to their full extent. So you, you heard about Fulcrum. There's also amazing uh, platforms, uh, the Manifold platform uh, out of the UK. Um, there's, there's Open Library for Humanities. Uh, the Janeway platform has books. There's, there's, there's too many to really mention here, but um, we, can, we can do a little bit of a deeper dive in the, in the Q&A period if that's something that folks are interested in. Um, I mentioned the fact that they can be interactive and that can be from their conception uh, on through to their, um, their, their life and the, and the impact that they create. And, and one of the things which I've also been particularly excited about is that these open monographs can result from complex collaborations. And these could be collaborations around the funding, collaborations around the production, uh, collaborations around the hosting, and it really makes um, you know, for some interesting um, opportunities uh, to get together and explore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I touched briefly on uh, funding and models, uh, and I know we're going to go and take a deep dive. Um, the university presses, um, you know, have frequently participated in, in, in the TOME and the SHIMP models. Um, there are also scholar-led initiatives, um, uh, particularly books like Punctum, uh, which is an academic press, uh, open book publishing, uh, and, and, and those are really interesting because they don't require any uh, author contributions uh, on the publishing side. Um, we have collective funding 
uh, based projects um, like the Knowledge Unlatched project, which many of the, the attendees here today um, are participating in. And um, more recently with Central European University Press, and I see uh, Francis is on the call with their um, sort of modified um, subscribe to open where the backlist um, is sold to fund the OA publication of the front list, which is a which is a model that um, may be attractive to presses that have been around for a while and have a substantive backlist. Um, that project is 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 done together. Um, you know, with with lyricists, and I see we've got Sharla on the call as well. So if there's questions on that, I'm sure we can dive in um, together with them. Um, and and collaboration uh, is tends to be key in this space. Um, I've been uh, excited to participate in some workshops um, around the COPEN project, which is community-led open infrastructure for monographs. Um, and the Hermios uh, project there, which you can see that that name is a, is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, and that's been a focus on the European based monograph um, projects with initiatives to help with the implementation of standards, the implementation of standard usage statistics, uh, peer review metrics and, and things like that. And I know um, that that uh, collaboration uh, recently branched out to build connections over on this side of the Atlantic as well. Next slide, please. So these open access monographs are not without their challenges, um, many of which can, of course, become opportunities as well. Um, those of you in acquisitions, and that's where I started my publishing career, know that um, with experimentation uh, comes, um, com comes challenges on the, on the acquisitions path. So when you're working, um, you know, particularly in the digital humanities, it may well be pre-proposal stage that you need to build a rudimentary proof of concept or platform to just present internally, let alone to have something um, that can be peer reviewed and, and move on to production. And this can increase the time uh, to publication. This can increase um, the expenses. Um, I know there's a lot of amazing work that's being done out of Brown University and out of Emory University. Um, working with different platforms and then subsequently, you know, moving along to, to publish with their university press uh, colleagues. Um, metadata, uh, for those of you uh, who aren't already beset on a, on a regular basis with uh, challenges around metadata can be a particularly important um, for open access uh, content because it does tend to live in many different places, um, as I mentioned. Uh, with these new open monographs comes a need to create robust uh, metadata. Had a wonderful conversation with John Shear and, and Clay Farr, uh, University of North Carolina and Longleaf um, respectively about um, you know, the role that third party distribution, which we've long known uh, as being key in the um, subscription book uh, marketplace, as really being critical in the dissemination of open access content as well. So there um, are some ongoing challenges uh, on that side that we hope maybe some of our librarian colleagues might be able to uh, provide some, some input and assistance on. Um, identifiers and standards. Uh, there are uh, still book publishers today and there may be some on this call that don't regularly register DOIs uh, for their content which is um, critical for discovery and linking and impact assessment uh, downstream. Uh, and sharing information about standards um, is incredibly important. Um, we tend just from the history of books to think about uh, books on an individual basis, but as we look at um, publication programs and infrastructure, what we're really looking at um, are books as a networked resource. Um, so the standards that implement linking and discovery um, are, are very, very uh, critical to the success. Um, marketing. Uh, I hope we've got some marketing uh, folks joining us on the call today. Um, just because content is open does not necessarily mean it will be automatically discovered um, or used. There's a lot of our existing infrastructure that we've built up for, uh, for licensed eBooks that is absolutely essential uh, for open as well. Um, usage statistics um, I touched upon before, there are 
uh, five, six, seven platforms sometimes that these books uh, will live on. And if you are the publisher and you're trying to kind of track back uh, to make a determination about where that book is being used and, and how often, as Elizabeth showed on the slide, um, how to pull usage data from multiple platforms that may have uh, different pe time periods that they collect. They may have different um, definitions around usage that they employ um, and how to get that, whoops, how to get that uh, usage information um, collated in a way that can be made sense of by authors, by uh, editorial, um, and, and more importantly, uh, when reporting back up through the uh, through the, the chain internally. Um, the Open Access Data Trust, for example, is um, one group that's really looking at how we can kind of tackle um, this issue. Um, amazing impact, again, as, as Elizabeth showed uh, around this open content, um, whether that's geographic distribution, whether that's use in the classroom, uh, many of these tight open titles, because they don't require uh, time through a library to order them and make them available on campus can be used right away in the classroom. Um, so, you know, it's literally straight off the press um, ebooks um, uh, being delivered to students today. And then one thing which is dear um, to my heart is, is digital preservation. You know, as we produce more and more content in a digital first and sometimes a digital only format, how do we make sure that that's going to be preserved for the scholarly record? Um, as well as uh, for the, the libraries and the researchers that depend upon these titles. Uh, when they are increasingly experimental and interactive, uh, how do you preserve them in a way that really um, is commensurate with their, their kind of stature and the time and, and energy that went into their production? The next slide. Uh, just a couple of, of things uh, left to talk about um, that I hope we can explore in the Q&A. Um, in the teaching and learning space, of course, we have the open monographs cousin, the open educational resources. Um, and so where the line between open monograph uh, be, ends and an open educational resource begins, you know, can be a, a gray area. Um, so anyone who'd love to talk about um, that, you know, we're here. Uh, so many times I've heard scholars say they're waiting until after they get tenure to do that project that they really want to do that that wide scale amb ambitious project and and I want to say there are more and more um, departments and universities that are putting an emphasis on open and so um, explore that project don't necessarily feel like you're going to have to wait uh, you know till post tenure and if you are a university that um, places a high value on open, you wanna prepare that pathway early. Your tenure committee should not be the first time that consideration of whether an open book counts uh, for, for tenure and promotion. When you're hiring, put it right into the job description um, that, that open is, uh, is preferred and is supported. So that prepares the way. And by the time you've got folks coming up for, for tenure and promotion, there's just not even a question um, outstanding in that regard. And then, and now more than ever, um, what I'm hearing from talking to press directors is that authors, particularly in the equity and social justice space, want to make sure that their content is going to be accessible to the folks that formed the research base. Uh, Archaeology, for example, and anthropology that touches on different regions in the world. You want to make sure um, that that content can be accessible, and it's a great um, reason to advocate for open access. Uh, and my last slide, what comes next? Uh, data. I mentioned there are so many open books out there now. This is crying out for a research project, probably for multiple research projects. You know, what are the levers that make these open monographs successful? You know, is it um, cutting out uh, the, the, the costs and making an efficient workflow? Is it putting that little extra um, effort into marketing? Is it the participation of the author? You know, what standards for, for so many reasons? Let's look into that because there's, there's so much data out there um, that can be explored. Communication and education. If you do have a, a project, it's one of the reasons why we're here today tell as many other publishers about what you're doing as possible. We shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are many models and, and, and one of them would probably work uh, for you. And if you're an author, should work for your book. Um, and then transparency. 
I mean, it's not just the book that should be open and accessible, it's underlying data, it's, um, it's potential for having um, an open review process, as well as um, open and standards based infrastructure for hosting that content. Uh, and uh, I'd love to dig into any of these uh, issues in the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Beth Bulakos, who is the director of the Amherst College Press and Lever Press. She received her doctorate from Cornell University, where she researched Latin American literature, film, and culture through a feminist lens. Before beginning at Amherst and Lever, she acquired books in education, Latin American and Latinx studies, and gender and sexuality studies at SUNY Press. Beth. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, and thanks for putting this panel together. Um, as Heather said, I'm always interested to hear what other people are doing, what new directions their open access is going in. And also thank you very much to Heather for what is I think the clearest overview of open access books I have heard yet to date. Um, it was very broad, but very concise as well. So I'm Beth Belucos, I'm the director of Amherst College Press and Lever Press. And I'm going to talk about one model, which is library funded open access publishing. Can advance, thanks Teresa. So we were founded both presses as being completely open access. Um, our funding comes from Amherst College and our library at Amherst College for that press. And then Lever Press is a consortium press that now includes 50 campuses whose libraries contribute on a sliding scale to our operating budget. So both of the presses are digital first. So we publish on Fulcrum uh, and release the titles digitally. And then we do release all of our books in print. They're all POD, except for uh, a couple exceptions that we have done actual print runs. Everything we do is peer reviewed. Both presses are members of the AU presses. So it goes through the same process as it would at any other university press. And we charge no fees to our authors, their institutions or our readers. So we're what is considered platinum open access. Sometimes you're hearing it now called diamond open access. So nobody involved in the process has any charges for things like production costs or um, any sort of overhead. You can advance, Teresa. So this is sort of how we're seeing the wheel of scholarly communications at this point and why we feel library supported um, open access is really an important model. So of course, all of this comes out of um, research that's done in libraries or research that's shared among scholarly groups. And you'll see going through the process, then of course, we wanna make that um, really widely available at no cost to those who are also outside of the university system who don't have access necessarily to a research library. So again, all of our projects go through the same sort of acquisitions process that you would at a traditional university press. They're peer reviewed. We do have options for open peer review if people are interested. And then they are all approved by faculty boards. Next slide. Here are a few of our recent Amherst College Press titles. And for the Amherst College Press, we are actually acquiring in list areas, which is a little bit different than the model for Lever. Um, we can go to the next. So Amherst College has very much tried to align its list with the strengths at the institution and to be really involved in the campus culture as well. And that's something that I think you're seeing across the board with a lot of university presses. You can go to the next. And something that was really great that Heather mentioned is the amount of collaboration that we're seeing with open access publishing. So Amherst College Press is partnered with Lever Press, which is the consortium of liberal arts institutions, and also with Fulcrum at Michigan Publishing Services. So all of our work for both of the presses are hosted on Fulcrum and they do all of our backend work as well for production. And so we very much are, are you know, sort of benefiting from all of the resources that they have at uh, Michigan Publishing Services. And really, it was a great fit for us because we very much were interested in long-term sustainability and durability. And the 
sort of phases of development that have gone on with some of the projects we have in the pipeline that have a little bit more in terms of bells and whistles for um, what they're able to do in the actual e-reader um, has been in thinking about what will be sustainable. And what I like to tell authors is of course, this is all funded by libraries. And so we're very much interested in things that will be durable and will be able to be used for a long time. We'll go to the next. And one thing that's really important is thinking about usage, of course, for our books. And, you know, I'm talking about just our Platinum Open Access Library funded model, but I did want to sort of bring it out and talk about some broader concerns in terms of open access. And so this and then the next map that we'll see, which we can also go to as well, were pulled on, these are just readers from one day in April. And then also if we go to the next one, um, Teresa, I think there should be the next one is May, I believe. So you'll see, we get some readership in different parts of the world, depending on the day. We have very good readership in South Asia, for example, also in South America. And I think, you know, we are getting to a place where we're getting more data, as Heather mentioned, about where and how our titles are being used. And thinking about that in tandem with how we're going to market these titles. And so Elizabeth had asked if, if I could say a little bit about what we've done in terms of marketing. And I said, I'm sure there will be a lot, a lot of people with a lot more experience um, from the marketing side than I have, but I can say from our own experience, we've had to sort of think about how people are getting to these titles. And of course, you know, there are the traditional routes through databases and libraries, um, but we are seeing a lot of traffic coming from social media as well. So we have put more marketing and promotions money behind um, doing a better job about getting communication out broadly um, through social media. And of course, again, we're not sales focused, we're not market-based. We do sell the actual print copies of our books, but really the librarians who are funding this are very interested in usage. And so these are both, both of these maps are in April and May um, after many places shifted to remote instruction. And we saw the increase for lever in usage go up 300% during that shift, which is quite remarkable. And Another thing to note is that at this point, um, we have uh, the usage for the titles are at about over 10,000 uses per title. And that's pretty remarkable considering some of them, if they were at a traditional university press, might have sold 200 print copies, let's say. So we're seeing a real, real sort of extraordinary amount of usage, uh, especially for some titles that are more specialized titles. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so something that's been really great in terms of working with Fulcrum is trying to think about how we're creating new paths for scholars in the humanities to communicate their ideas. And so we have had some new developments in the platform. Of course, there was already the ability to use audiovisual um, in the platform and some other features. We had, for example, a book on new jazz that has clips of the jazz artists and bits and pieces of documentaries about them um, at the beginning of each chapter, which is really fun. But we're also in the process of creating new usability in the full from platform for a, a French novel that will have facing page translation, but it will have a real huge host of other uh, capabilities that will allow for great classroom use or for language learners. And it will be sort of fully integrated into the actual text of the ebook, which we're very excited about. All of this, of course, comes at a cost, and, and that's something else that I could talk about if others are interested in it. That title in particular, the um, sort of innovation fund that we have for these more innovative titles will be used for the entire year on, on this one title. So, um, you know, there is a cost related to this beyond just the actual cost that we're budgeting for each of the titles, which is about what group one presses in the AU presses spend per title. 
So we can advance. And so again, uh, I'm happy to take any questions about any of this um, and thinking a little bit more about um, marketing and promotions as well, if others want to chat about that. Elizabeth, are you able to unmute to uh, pass off the baton? I think she might be frozen. Oh, no. Well, then I will pass off the baton. Um, thank you, um, Beth. And uh, I'm happy to pass uh, on now to our other Beth in this presentation, uh, Beth. We get images, grants, and digital projects at University of Washington Press. And uh, Elizabeth, you are back, so please feel free to take over I'm my back. intro. I'm sorry, for some reason my internet flipped out. Um, so yes, Beth Fugit manages grants and digital projects at the University of Washington Press, including the press's first open access books. She also worked as an acquisitions editor at Washington, and before that as a writer, editor, translator, and teacher in Latin America and Europe, as well as in the United States. Her graduate work focused on post-colonial literature and language education. Beth. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I want to preface my presentation by saying that I'm not here as an expert on open access publishing, because in fact, at Washington, we've only recently begun to publish open access books. In that sense, we're rather typical, since most university presses in the States now have some experience with open access, but for most, it's still relatively new. So I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing at Washington as a kind of case study, an example of what you might find at university presses you're interested in working with. Next slide, please. So Washington is in many ways a typical mid-sized university press. Like most presses our size, we publish in a select number of fields. In our case in history, we focus on subfields in, Asia, in US, Asian, and environmental history. We depend very heavily on book sales to cover our costs. About two thirds of our operating budget comes from sales compared to just a relatively small amount from our university. Because we depend so much on sales, we've been concerned about doing anything that might undercut them. And that's the main reason we've only recently and cautiously begun to publish open access. Next slide, slide please. So here's a snapshot of our program. We published our first born open access book just over two years ago, but we'll be publishing several more this year. We've also experimented with opening books up after initial embargo period so that we can collect more of the initial sales revenue. We've made backlist books openly available and hope to do more of these. Just yesterday, in fact, I submitted a grant application to a private foundation to support another 10 books. So we now have, or are about to have 32 books openly available just a small fraction of the roughly 1300 books we have in print. In short, it's a very small program, but hopefully a growing program. Next slide, please. So our open access publications have been made possible by several recent initiatives. Uh, what you see here is in the full list of open access funding sources, just the ones we've been involved in. Uh, it doesn't include some of the earliest longstanding programs like Knowledge and Latch, which we haven't participated in yet. But one of the remarkable things I think about these programs is that most of them are just a few years old, showing that there is a growing interest on the part of funders in supporting open access work. Next slide, please. So to make our open access books easily discoverable and available, we post them on the sites where scholars are accustomed to finding materials of interest. On several platforms that are widely used for scholarship, um, these are a few that you're probably familiar with. Next slide. We're also piloting our own platform, Manifold, which was developed by colleagues at the University of Minnesota Press and is similar to Fulcrum in some ways. And I should say that we also love Fulcrum and are working on a Fulcrum project, but don't have anything to show you from that yet. 
But like Fulcrum, Manifold has a very reader-friendly interface, which works well on a variety of devices. You can see snapshots here of one of our books on a computer screen and on my phone. Um, so the next time you're out for a walk and sit down on a park bench or have to wait in a line somewhere, you can pull out your phone and read David Biggs' book about the environmental impacts of the wars in Vietnam. And so can anybody with a phone and an internet or phone connection anywhere in the world. Manifold also allows us to link supplemental materials like videos, maps, and primary sources to a book to create a publication that's not simply an open digital version of a print book, but goes beyond that to offer more than the print book can. And Manifold has built in tools that allow readers to annotate the text or to share selections of it via social media. So in this way too, it goes a step beyond what print books can offer. Next slide. We're involved in one other open access pilot initiative that I wanna mention briefly for more complex collaborative digital projects in indigenous studies, which we're developing in collaboration with UBC Press, which is taking the lead on this. So here on the left, you see a screenshot of our first publication, which is still very much in development on the Scalar platform and draft form here. But before long, it will look something like UBC's first publication, which you see here on the right. These projects are much more complex and we currently have just this one in development. Next slide. I've talked about what we're doing and how we're doing it, but also wanna take a moment to talk about why we're publishing open access. We're doing it in part to respond to authors' interests. Some of our authors have asked us about the possibility of making open access editions of their books available because they wanted to make their research available in the communities where they carried it out, out of a sense of accountability, to bring their research back to the people most invested in it, or continue conversations with researchers and scholars they worked with. Authors are also interested in reaching the widest possible audience, both in the States and internationally. Some of them are aware of the numbers of students, both here and elsewhere, who struggle to buy books or do without books and don't want cost to be a barrier for any of their students. In some cases, especially for Euro European scholars, their funders, the funders of their research, have OA mandates. As a publisher devoted to making, oh, I'm sorry, go back still. As a publisher devoted to making research widely available, we share many of the same goals. Given all the hard work we put into publishing books, we want to make sure that they're read and accessible to as many people as possible, including students, activists, and independent scholars, especially in the global South. Another powerful motivation for us to publish open access books is to take advantage of the available funding for open access, which is not as plentiful still as we might like, but has increased in the last few years. Uh, as you all probably know, sales of most scholarly monographs don't cover their publication costs. So at Washington, we try to find outside support for most of the books we publish and open access funding is a small but growing source for this. Um, also, to speak frankly here, the traditional publishing model in which the cost of publishing a scholarly book is supposed to be covered by sales no longer works well for some fields. To give one example, at Washington, we have a long standing list in East Asian studies, but just recently began publishing on South Asia. We've quickly built an impressive collection of books that have won several awards through a series with a three stellar series editors. And yet these books don't sell as well as books in US history, for example. So the unfortunate reality is that we can't publish as many books in the field as we'd like. A different publishing model with funding upfront rather than through sales would make it possible for us to better serve this field. Next slide. I mentioned that our open access program is still quite new and small, but we do have some data already to show the increased use of our OA books compared to non-OA books. Two of the platforms the books are on, JSTOR and Muse, host our non-OA books as well as our OA books. So we've been able to compare the two, looking at comparable sets of 20 open access and 20 non-open access books. And the results have been really striking. Our open access books are used on average 13 times more than the comparable non-open access books and in many more parts of the world. Uh, last year, for example, over a six month period in which we compared use of the two, 
our open access books were used in 123 countries compared to just 21 for the non oe books. So ours is a very small set and uh, this is still relatively new, but um, others have reported similar results. Next slide. So for the past two years, as we've uh, begun our open access program, I've talked with about 50 authors about the possibility of publishing their books open access. A few raised it themselves, but most hadn't thought about it until I mentioned this possibility. Most were interested or even enthusiastic, sometimes wildly so about the idea, but not everyone. Our authors have been more likely not to want to participate in an OA program when the books appear to be different in some way. Uh, I suspect that as OA becomes more common and people become more aware of the advantages of making their books openly available, this might change and they might actually prefer to see a bookmark as open access. But I think the jury's still out on that. Some junior scholars have raised questions about tenure. Interesting, at least for our authors, um, when they talked with their colleagues and chairs, they found that people were supportive of publishing their books open access. Their chairs simply wanted to know that the books had been peer reviewed and were being published by a reputable publisher. And a couple wanted to know if print copies would also be available. But some of our authors were still concerned about whether the decision might affect them in some unpredictable way in the future. A few authors have also asked whether making a book openly available would make it harder to find a publisher in another part of the world to publish a print edition for the local market there, especially in places where having a local print edition is really important. This has come up for us on, for our books on South Asia, for example. We found that some publishers have been reluctant, but not others, and we're trying to find terms that will make it possible and advantageous for them. Next slide. So as publishers, we also have some concerns of our own. Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, we're concerned about our financial sustainability and about making sure that we can continue to publish books. Um, so far, there seems to be theories and evidence both ways about whether making a book openly available cuts into sales or might in fact boost sales, uh, but we don't have enough experience yet to know for sure. And uh, unfortunately, we can't afford to take many risks. Um, we'd also like to find an equitable funding model for open access, one that doesn't depend on support from an author's institution. So that no matter whether an author works at an Ivy League university or a community college in the US or Ecuador or Nigeria or wherever they are, they'd have the same opportunity to publish their book openly if they want to. Some of the funding models, the, the, the diamond open access, the, the um, model at Lever and Amp, Beth talked about, um, do support this. Uh, I was pleased to learn that the new open access grant opportunity we applied for yesterday from the Guy Shu Foundation, for example, is open to nonprofit publishers all over the world. So there are, so there's, there are good movements in this direction, but I think still um, some needs to be done. And we're thinking um, still about the problem I mentioned a moment ago about how to make sure that open access publishing doesn't have unintended negative consequences but rather contributes to the optimal dissemination of our books um, around the world without undermining the publishing infrastructure here or abroad. Um, finally, we're also concerned with open access publishing as with any kind of digital publishing about issues like accessibility to people with print disabilities, um, preservation of the work and, uh, and other questions like that. Next slide. So I've put here a few links to some of the programs that I mentioned. Uh, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Beth, thank you so much. And we have a lot of really great, great questions to get to. So we'll dive right in. And please, if you ask a question and I should have asked this earlier, can you identify um, where you're from and what your role is, whether you're a scholar, a publisher, a researcher um, or someone else? So first, I'm going to start with a question that came in through the chat um, about book contracts. Can the panelists speak to how the publishing agreements, i.e. contracts, for OA projects differ from conventional publishing contracts? Is funding a part of these agreements and are permissions a bottleneck? And I think, Beth Bulacos, let's start with you and then take the other panelists. Sure, we were really fortunate to have help from Council at University of Michigan, actually, to help us come up with what we consider an author-centric kind of contract. 
And so it's very clear as to the rights that the author has in the publishing agreement. Um, the author by default retains copyright for their project. But we did have to outline a very different type of contract in that we really needed to be clear upfront about what things would be included in fulcrum um, and how much, of course, because sometimes scholars in the very early stages, if we're contracting a really digitally rich project, have a lot of ideas about what they'd like to do, but not all of that is necessarily possible. So it's been very important for us right in the beginning um, if there is an advanced contract to come to an agreement as to what can actually be included in the project. Um, and it also makes very clear who's responsible for what in terms of alt text and other things that we have to think about um, for the actual digital project. So at Washington, we don't have a separate track for OA books. All of our books are contracted um, in the same way with our standard contract, which authors can negotiate over. And then once a book has been accepted, um, that's when I'll talk with authors about OA if we see options, funding options to support their books. Um, or in cases of authors with backlist books, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to them if we see an opportunity to make their book openly available. And the only thing that we do then is uh, draw up a contract addendum. Um, our main contracts generally put copyright in the press's name if the author would like to have um, the copyright in their own name for the OA book. Um, we'll transfer the copy right back to them. And we also ask them to choose a Creative Commons license so they can indicate how they would like their material to be used. Most of our authors have been using um, the Creative, uh, Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, um, non-derivative non licenses, um, which still allow, I should stress, you know, still allow people to, for example, um, create foreign translations of the books, but leaves the control with the author over, you know, who's going to do the translation and how it's going to be published and, and the rest of that. I feel like CCBY licenses could be their own panel, right? Um, discussing discussing what, what works best for what product, but we have a similar process at Michigan to what uh, Lever is doing, um, thinking about uh, how these specific parts of the manuscript um, that that work on fulcrum or that are enhanced uh, or in other areas are, are somewhat different from a print book um, will be managed in that contract. Uh, and part of that question was also about funding and about permissions. And so, uh, yes, we do try to specify um, the funding in the contract if that's possible at the time, it isn't always, and uh, the permissions issues as well. I mean, in our standard contract, authors are responsible for their own permissions. I'm sure that's true for other places as well. So, okay, um, Susan Birch from Middlebury College in Vermont says, thank you for this excellent panel. My question is about the access part of open access. Can you tell us more about how your presses actively imply inclusive design features so that the OA products are fully accessible to disabled users? I've been struck, for example, by the absence of accessible fonts, visual descriptions, and accessible indexes in many OA books. Thank you. Who would like to take that? I might pass it back to you, Elizabeth, because I know there is a there's a team at Michigan um, who works on Fulcrum who has been tackling this for quite some time. So yes, um, actually, University of Michigan Press and Michigan Publishing um, just became Benetech certified. I think we're the first university press to do that. So uh, we've made accessibility a priority, and it is a lot of work, actually, um, the, the different kinds of, of technological things that you need to do to an open access manuscript to make it fully accessible. But our commitment is to, to have that accessibility happen. Um, so. You know, I think as as we pioneer this and as more and more presses step in and kind of work with this accessibility and look at the multiplicity of users out there, I think it will become more common. Uh, but um, issues, yes, there are font issues, there are um, alt text in terms of images um, and that sort of thing. So I think older open access books that have been, you know, have PDF scanned and made open aren't taking advantage of the technology. But as we produce new born OA titles, um, accessibility is a priority. 
Can I yeah. just add? Oh, sorry. I was just going to add um, on that that I've talked to a number of presses that have put together, you know, internal task forces around that topic because it is so critical um, and touches on every department uh, and and requires author participation, you know, from from the earliest you know points in production to make sure you know that that goes smoothly. So for for presses that have put together task forces, and I think University of Michigan. Uh, publishing is, is one of them, sharing that information out, um, you know, what was learned in that process and how that's played out in turn with the different um, department touch points would be really useful for folks joining on the call. Yeah. Um, I should say at Washington that we've only just begun focusing on accessibility in our digital books um, and we've been doing it thanks in part to an open access project. Um, a shout out here to the folks at Emory University who funded one of our tome books and one of the requirements was that the book would be accessible to people with print disabilities so that we had to learn how to do that. Uh, it's not as hard as we feared that it would be and everything that we have learned about it we learned from the folks at Michigan who are the real leaders on this. Um, I also serve on the Association of University Presses Digital Publishing Committee, and this is one of the things that we've been talking about on our committee a lot this year. And, and actually, Elizabeth serves on the committee with me too. And um, we are talking about ways to organize some uh, efforts across the association to get uh, presses, which are, I, I think, um, quite commonly starting to realize that they need to do more and not yet sure how to do more um, to help all of us figure out how to take these next steps that we need to take. Great, thank you. Joyce Harrison from University of Kansas Press asks, I'd like to hear about costs, funding, staffing, and workflow. However, since this is meant mostly for historians, perhaps that's saved for another webinar. Um, I do think that this is a great question for our panel, actually, because it directly influences the historians and how their work is produced. Um, not in terms of the research stage, obviously, but in terms of creating the output of that publication, so. Beth, Beth or Heather, do you wanna take that one? <laughs> Um, I guess I can start. Um, we probably have the, the least interesting answer though at Washington, since as I say, our program is so small, just getting started a lot of it uh, in a very improvised way. Um, I don't know if you've noticed my title, Grants and Digital Projects Manager. It's a very unusual position. I think there are maybe two of us in the whole AU Presses community who have titles that are like that. But for us, it makes sense in a ways because all of the, um, open access and more digital, um, complex digital projects that we're doing are grant funded. So to the extent that I can find funding for them, um, we, can, we, can, we can do them. Um, it, it, I, I should also mention that um, because we're a, a, a mid-sized press with a relatively small staff, um, we are also very concerned about the, the workload on other staff members and wanting to um, keep control over that. So that's something that we have to think about as we take on new projects. Um, I do much of the work as the digital projects editor of working with the authors, um, working on their files, um, but uh, it also involves some work from our EDP department department, our editorial design and production department, obviously, and also especially from our marketing department, because as, as uh, Heather and both Beth both mentioned, um, promoting these books um, in the same ways that we promote all of our other books, um, especially um, making good use of social media, um, which um, a study that colleagues in Michigan did a few years ago um, found is, is one of the ways that people find open books, um, you know, all of this is really important in, in publishing open books. So it's, it's something that it does involve people across the press. Um, but as I say, we at Washington are, are in some ways making this up as we, as we go along and still working out our processes. 
Elaine Maisner from UNC Press has asked the, a very similar question, which is, have we made any interdepartmental workflow adjustments? And it seems to me that one of the biggest is um, not just necessarily in EDP, but is in marketing. Um, and I wonder if, if some of the panelists could talk about that. Heather, I think you've had a lot of experience in this. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I do want to talk about the 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 costs. Um, so so don't let me forget about that. Okay. Um, you know, I had I think some of the best conversations that I've had around marketing needs for for open access books have been with with Susan Dore from University of Minnesota Press and the Manifold team, um, because you know as was mentioned, the same the same types of marketing you know are are absolutely necessary and. For many um, open monographs, there is a, a print component, and so dissemination of information about the print, you know, proceeds in, in the same way that that would happen. With some complexities, um, though, I should add around some uh, systems out there that were just not designed for zero cost items to be included, uh, and cut can cause some um, ripple effects uh, when you do put. Um, items in with 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 zero costs and some of the larger, you know, ebook aggregations have struggled with, uh, you know, what kinds of models um, they could use uh, to include open content, which is something that libraries find very desirable, um, but the the aggregations, you know, may may struggle with from a cost perspective. Uh, I think you know the interesting thing, so many interesting things can be done when marketing open because those. Um, uh, geographic and cost barriers, you know, are, are not present, and, and particularly for um, those books that do that where research was done, uh, you know, in in other in other parts of the world, it could be really interesting to work with um, regional book collaborations, you know, out of out of Africa, you know, out of Asia, out of Australia, uh, and you know, when you do go to large sites like OAPEN that have, um, you know, broad hosting agreements, you can really see uh, the, the amazing, um, you know, variety uh, of titles that, that are out there and, and growing all the time. Um, on the cost side, um, you know, before I forget, um, it's really challenging to try to tease apart what are the costs that could be separated from uh, a, a print, you know, uh, total access monograph. Um, there have been experiments and, and studies, and I don't want to speak for folks who are attending this call, I have much more insight into this than I do, that have shown that the impact on the print sales is actually not as great as one might expect. And so the amount that you need to bridge to bring you up to the expected revenue uh, from a non-OA title, you know, might not be that significant, might be you know, as in the five thousand dollar range, for example, and the I think it was one of the questions in the chat was you know different costs um, and and different funding amounts are, are out there. I think no one really knows uh, at this point um, what is a standard monograph. You know, those of us who love books and make books feel like there could be no such thing as a standard monograph. You it's it's not a widget, uh, as as Susan Dor you know would say. You can't you can't. Uh, necessarily look at it in that way. But when we are trying to do planning, um, you know, more insight is really useful. I participated in a project um, in the journal space around transparency and article processing charges. And so journal articles are typically much more standardized um, than books. And even in that context, it was impossible. Every press calls something by a different term. Um, there's so many asterisks about overhead that's not included or departments that are combined in one way, you know, in one country in another way, uh, in another. And I'm, I'm really hoping that some projects like um, Invest in Open Infrastructure can put together some workshops, really bring together uh, different players, different projects from the, the open monograph space, you know, talk through um, some of these things and get a better idea. And, and, and one more thing I'll add on, on costs at the risk of, of talking too much. Um, the, there's a lot of upstream investment. The Emory project was mentioned and, and, and I mentioned Brown. And a lot of times when there are projects, um, whether they're participating in, in through Tome or through some other mechanism, if there is um, set aside institutional funding, 
that might go to the to the prototype to the MVP before it's ever accepted, um, you know, by a university press for publication, and and so there can be the cost can hit at many different times uh, rather than just you know at the end of the process where you might think about what it's like to host um, such an experimental project. So. I would, I would actually add in terms of the discussion of cost and staffing that there was a bit of a learning curve, I think, for the librarians who are funding these two ventures, that there is such an incredible amount of labor that goes into both acquiring and shepherding these projects through the process. Um, and also then, of course, the production side of things that um, you know, one of the goals in the beginning had been thinking about how to get down the cost of the monograph. And at this point, we are budgeting again, the same as group one presses. And so I think there is a need to be realistic about the costs of this, especially in a platinum model where um, we're not really sustained on any sort of revenue on the back end. And in terms of workflow, I think the difference has to do more with the digital aspect of it in terms of any changes to workflow and um, thinking about when and how to do peer review for those digital projects or the components that really cannot be in a late stage for peer review because you can't go back and, and change some things. So um, what Cheryl Ball likes to say is for the digital projects, peer review often and early. Thank you. And I think that ties in really closely to two questions that were asked uh, about funding in the, the chat and the Q&A. One was from Susan Ferber at Oxford, which is, um, you know, can you address how much money from funding sources you consider sufficient to offset the lost in sales? Um, each funding source seems to be for a different amount of money, and my limited experience thus far has not shown a magic number of what we really need to make the books OA and not lose sales income on them. Um, and I think you guys have addressed that. And then the second one related to that is, what is the primary mechanism that libraries fund the books for, um, college, for Amherst College Press and Lever Press? And Beth, I don't know if you want to talk more about that or if you feel that you've covered I'm not totally sure I understand that question. What's the primary mechanism? How do libraries, like, in what way do libraries fund the books for Amherst College Press and Lever Press? Like, what's the process? It, so uh, for Amherst College Press, we were founded on basically two retirements in the library. And then our budget comes from endowments and also the operations budget of the library. Then for Lever Press, it's a sliding scale. And so um, the members give based on their collections budgets, their acquisitions budgets. So they give um, now for the second phase of Lever, actually there are more tiers for membership. Um, does that answer the question? I think so. Yes, thank you. I want to um, ask this question. It's jumping uh, tracks a little bit, but I don't want to lose it, um, which is how would open access work for an independent scholar who is maybe not affiliated with an institution? So there are those um, scholar led um, presses that I mentioned, um, uh, Punctum Books, uh, Open Book Publishing. Um, there's, if you look up the COPEM project, uh, there are some smaller presses um, and there are no author facing charges there. The, the projects are completely um, peer reviewed. The, the funding models range from uh, a library or university supporter model to um, an individual donations model uh, and sometimes, um, you know, uh, combinations thereof. So I, I also know that some presses um, because the acquisitions decisions are made, uh, you know, in a, in a funding blind basis, that um, they they do have staff members or university side staff members who will go out um, and actually look uh, for funding for projects. So if you are an unaffiliated scholar, that doesn't necessarily count you out for an open access publication. 
Yeah, I should, I should mention that if you're an unaffiliated scholar in history and you have a project right now, uh, there are 20 presses participating in SHUMP, the Sustainable History Monograph Pilot. So um, the funding for the open access publication of those books comes originally from the, the Mellon Foundation, which is supporting it. Um, to UNC and Longleaf, which, which are operating it. So um, this would be an opportunity for any scholar whose book is accepted by one of the participating presses to, um, to publish open access. Thank you. So this question is from Emily Farrell. She says, Beth, it's amazing to see the increase in usage. How well are you able to distinguish whether any of that usage is from bots or Sci-Hub, for instance? And in your conversations with libraries on usage, how often are you talking about or asked about value weighting for usage? And in other words, whether you see a comparative increase in citation. Yeah, so we do like the University of Michigan use altmetrics. And so we focus a little bit on that when talking about sort of substantive usage. And there are folks at Fulcrum who are working on getting better data um, and thinking a little bit about, well, we can't necessarily know so much about course adoption. So I often get a question from um, folks about course adoption, but we can now, there was an experiment um, to see what IP data we could get to see what um, universities and institutions are using our books at any given time um, the most. And so there is more robust information about the data, but this is something of course that is still very much in the process and um, will be something that we learn more about as we go on. I can just say from a personal side that seeing some titles over 10,000 uses, I'm actually totally okay with <laughs> plenty of that being, being bots or uh, not necessarily people who are reading the whole book, but librarians will remind you that it's also very hard to know actual usage for print titles as well. Just because libraries acquire them, they may never circulate. Just because they circulate doesn't mean necessarily that anyone's reading uh, more than one chapter or anything. So uh, we have a lot of sort of similar issues with open access projects. And the kind of things that we'd like to know more about are how much time does somebody spend on one chapter, for instance, or is one chapter being used a lot more than others? Um, and a lot of this is uh, sort of being being figured out as we go. Yeah, if I can add, I mean, most of the um, hosting platforms do have provisions in place that will take care of a lot of the, the bots. Um, Sci-Hub is a little bit more challenging because of the phishing use of, of, of actual credentials and then the subsequent use, you know, happening, you know, outside um, of the, the publisher hosting platform. Um, I also, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I sit on the counter board and um, Counter made some resources available uh, in the fall last year uh, as a result of so many platforms completely opening up um, as a result of um, the, the, the need during COVID. And if you didn't require registration on your platform uh, for, those, um, for that trial access, it's, it can be very challenging to trace that usage back uh, in every case to specific universities. So the, the, the desire to not have any impediment to access the content can down the line when you're trying to do um, you know, um, analysis, you know, can, can put up some hurdles. So if you're looking at your usage and, um, and it is not what you expect and, and it can't entirely be sorted out, you know, there may be um, things uh, from the publishing side that can be uh, tweaked a little bit um, you know, moving forward. But uh, as uh, as Beth said, it's it's fantastic to see the amount um, of attention and and just the the widespread impact that these books can bring. And Megan Lewis asks a related question. Did we lose Elizabeth? Is Elizabeth frozen? We might have lost her again via the internet. Um, I, th I think while we wait for her to come back on, there was actually a question earlier on that I wanted to, to respond to um, from Joyce Harrison sure. about for authors who, for whom OA isn't a problem, 
in which fields are they in? Um, just to stress again, for most of our authors, they've, they've, OA isn't a problem. They've been interested and, and often really enthusiastic about it. Um, in, in, in the Sustainable History Monograph pilot, what we found, and I don't think that this is any surprise, is that authors who are doing the most interdisciplinary research that has current relevance are the ones who are most excited about making their books openly available. So our three projects in this initiative are all books that are interdisciplinary history and archeology span or history and anthropology. Um, one focusing on the uh, lasting environmental uh, impacts of slavery in Dominican, the Caribbean. Um, one looking at overcoming uh, religious violence in India and another looking at how um, development thinking going back to the colonial period in Bangladesh has um, used environmental justifications in a way that um, it, it is really counterproductive for, for people in, in communities there and how some of these same justifications underlie policies around climate change and development today. So in all three of these cases, um, people really wanted the research to be available in the places where the work is relevant and, and they feel that it really has important current um, use and implications as well. Yeah, anthropology is um, is a really interesting space. I noticed um, that we've got Vivian uh, Berghund on the call, and in the on the journal side, um, you know, anthropology has really made a big push um, to do open, uh, cross society um, collaborations, cross publisher in some cases um, collaborations, and so um, you know, it would be it would be amazing to see whether um, societies in the in the history space or interdisciplinary. Uh, groups that you know include a lot of historians might um, kind of band together and, and look for models that could uh, could really open up um, a substantial amount of content moving forward. Thank you, and I'm so sorry for the spotty internet today. It's never a good time for that. Um, I want to get to a couple of questions that we have on reception. Um, and tenure. So one is from Jordan Sly from University of Maryland Libraries. He says, Beth mentioned vocal support from promotion and tenure committees in general, but have you seen specific language anywhere out there with the parameters for including OA monographs in a portfolio? How about examples of um, p and committees and successful candidates who earned tenure on OA monographs alone um, with no previously public uh, published traditional publications. Um, and then Susan Ferber from Oxford asks, uh, can you drill down more into the handling of academic reviews and information for authors about the impact, if any, of OA on the peer reviewed reception of their work? Um, I think those are directly related. Beth Fugit, do you want to start with that? Um. Yeah, so let me think. In terms of the handling of academic, the, the, the hmm. second part of the question, I'm not sure that I can speak to because, again, um, the the books that we put into our, our open access programs have all gone through the exact same acquisitions and peer review process of all of our other books. And I normally don't talk with authors about open access until after their books have been approved. So um, I'm not sure that that is relevant. In terms of, of for, for us, it's a, it's a very important question, but but I, I, I can't really speak to that. Um, in terms of, of um, tenure committees, um, you know, some associations and AHA is one of them have um, guidelines that, that they've put out for the review of open access and digital projects and tenure and promotion. So I think making sure that um, departments are familiar with these, sharing information about them, um, 
uh, is, is, is a good way. As Heather said, um, starting the conversations early on in departments, um, I think is also very helpful. Um, and there are, I think, increasing numbers of universities that actually have explicit policies about this. I know at Emory, for example, they have an, an open access policy. So it's really clear on campus um, in all departments that open access work is considered right alongside um, non-open access work in evaluation for tenure and promotion. Um, and I'm just seeing um, Susan's question about published reviews after projects come out, not peer reviews. Um, again, it's been, for, for us, it's, it's been too new. I don't know, Elizabeth, maybe you've got more um, um, experience at Michigan, but we haven't, I don't think we've yet seen published reviews that talk about the open access nature of the work. We've, you know, we've gotten a lot of other kinds of feedback on our open access publications. Um, one of our authors uh, recently mentioned um, someone in Romania reaching out to her and inviting her to come and give a talk there, someone who she'd never met before. So things like this happen. Um, but I, I um, maybe, maybe another panelist can speak to this better than I can. Just to really quickly answer your question before Heather talks, uh, we've had several of our tome and shimp titles reviewed now, um, and there's no mention in the reviews that they're open access. Uh, it's really just a straight up review of the scholarship is what I've noticed. So that factor doesn't seem to be coming into play in published reviews, at least in my experience. Heather? Yeah, on the, on the peer review front, I mean, when you, when the, when you know from an author perspective, you know, from the outset that, that they're, they, they're going for an open access publication, you can do some interesting things. So I was recently at the Knowledge Futures Group um, and our PubPub um, hosting platform had a number of MIT Press uh, uh, titles and you can do an open community review, a collaborative review process on a draft for something that is intended um, to be open. And that, um, you know, happens in parallel to traditional peer review. Um, and I mean, two, two books that spring to mind, uh, Data Feminism and another book called Annotation, which is close to my heart because I love annotation as many people know. Um, and it's interesting, you know, when you, when you do talk to authors, the value that they get from the open community review where they, in many cases, have have, have invited a wide variety of folks to participate um, is quite different than the, um, the feedback that they, that they take from um, the, the anonymous um, peer review. They automatically assume uh, and probably that the, that the peer reviewers and maybe because it's an MIT connection are you know, gonna be more prestigious if they don't know them than necessarily their, their co coworkers and colleagues who are, who are uh, doing you know, open collaborative peer review. And so it's interesting the kind of weight that authors put on those different um, types of review and, and having that open review process does not seem you know, at all to have a negative effect on the, you know, the ultimate open uh, version you know, of the book, so. Yeah, going a little bit on what Beth was saying, the impact that we've heard from authors that has gotten them the most excited about having done their work open access is really about being sort of invited to give talks immediately all over the world on, on their books. Or for example, we have one book on narco culture and the author was invited to give many talks and be part of many panels um, from universities in Mexico. And it was really short the amount of time between those invitations and the actual publication of the book. And I had done two other books with this author before, traditional books, and it was just such a marked difference for him. Um, or we have other people who have gotten um, requests to translate their work into languages that are not necessarily having to do with the actual sort of book itself. Um, so for example, we have this book, History Without Chronology. It's written by a historian of East Asia. It was almost immediately after we put it on Fulcrum, um, got a request to translate it into Turkish. 
And this author had two other books with university presses that he had not gotten those kind of requests, um, especially in that time frame. So that for authors has been super impactful in terms of thinking beyond just like the journal peer reviews of post-pub books. And Mick Gustinda Duffy from Georgia asks a related question, which is, have the panelists mentioned the impact of the pandemic and distance learning on these impressive usage numbers? Um, yes, there were a, a few different slides. I had one at the beginning. Um, Beth Bulikos had one, Beth Puget had one about how um, we've just had an explosion in usage actually um, since the pandemic started. Um, and part of that is, you know, this discoverability in other countries, most of it is international actually, um, which I think is fantastic for. And I should say in Washington during the time that we were tracking the comparative sets of open access and non-open access books, this was, you know, both before and then during the pandemic. So we saw for both kinds of books, usage increase, usage increase for the non-open access books too. But the difference was really striking that, that open access books were, were increased much, um, more um, uh, rapidly and um, to much higher numbers than the, the paid access books. And Mick asks, asks a really great follow-up question, which is, will this impact continue post-pandemic? I'm going to throw it out to the panelists. You know, I think in terms of the difference in use between open access and non-open access books, I mean, there are other larger studies out there. Springer Nature published a, a study recently on uh, three years worth of data on open and non-open access books on their platform that showed about 10 times more use for open access books and much more use in um, underserved parts of the world. So, and that was all pre-pandemic. So, so I, I suspect that it will continue post-pandemic. I think that, um, access to digital resources is going to be increasingly important and that uh, access to and the freely available resources will be a huge part of that. Yeah, I too am hopeful that uh, the impact will continue post pandemic. I think there's now a growing awareness even just of open access books on the part of faculty and instructors so that um, you know, if they get good student feedback, if it's been sort of aiding to the ease of use for these projects, uh, I do think that we'll see the impact continue. And also when we're thinking about, will there be more virtual classes and virtual learning and um, the ease of open access and all of that, I think will help our usage numbers moving forward. And to think about the libraries that are under-resourced that will continue to be even more probably under-resourced and have their budgets cut. Um, you know, there are a lot of instructors who don't have access to even through the library, the text that they want to, to teach. And so I think in that case, you know, our model is important because it's being paid for by institutions that have the money to contribute, but everyone can use it. And I was I would just add that the experimentation that happened as a result of the pandemic, you know, can can be studied. You know, there are presses that um, do use their institutional repositories um, to make books open after an embargo, and in many cases, one the embargo period was dropped, and two some books that might have been excluded because they were identified as textbooks were included, and so now you know that um, that data can be analyzed again. My my cry out for like. There's amazing data out there that needs um, research projects to happen um, on it. Hopefully we can take um, the best uh, and, and, and move forward on a regular basis. Yeah, at Michigan, we feel really, um, really positive about the future of both open access publishing and free to read, um, you know, being able to track uh, these explosive use, usage stats and, thinking about just a, a future in which people don't um, travel as much perhaps or, or are able to access things that they would not have been able to access as easily. Um, we really see that, that this will continue to last. 
we're almost at time. We do have some questions remaining that are um, kind of really more publisher and library specific. And there's one um, for Beth Bulacos, which is about library funding for the ACP and Lever Press models. Um, I think Knowledge Unlatched is also a, a library funded project. Do you feel that, um, do you think, or do the libraries think that this has been a good investment of their money? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say probably, honestly, not all, which is we'll see in the second round of the campaign. There are some institutions who contributed who, for whatever reasons, um, whether it's they're just under financial constraints and they, they can't do it or they have not thought it has gone as they wanted it to. But overall, we've seen that the membership has been really excited about the sort of growing usage, the titles, the kind of different projects that we can do, thinking about a liberal arts ethos. Um, and we have seen institutions that, so Lever originally came out of the Oberlin group of libraries, which are um, primarily small liberal arts colleges. And so now we've seen interest even just beyond that group. And so I think now that we are up and running and, and we have catalogs coming out and books coming out, um, I think that many, but not all, have thought it was a good investment. And on the Amherst College side of things, we very much are trying to be part of the campus life, the community. We have an internship program. Liberal arts colleges are very interested in how they can give students hands-on sort of job preparation. And that has been an important goal for us in terms of what we can do for the campus itself. So yes, I can say on that side, I think there's a, a definite positive. Great, thank you. And then we talked about this a little bit, but we talked about independent scholars, resources for independent scholars, but Elaine Meisner asks again, if you've not addressed already, what about equity for authors if and when they are asked to supply subventions for OA publications? Um, in other words, not all scholars have access to this funding depending on their institutional affiliation and many other factors. And I know every acquisitions editor in this room has been in the position of asking an author to ask their departments for funding and the author coming back and saying, our department doesn't do that. I mean, some do and some don't. Um, so do, what about the question of funding equity? I mean, I can say that's precisely why we started our presses with the models that we have, right? Because there was some thought in the beginning with Lever, well, would it only be open to the faculty at participating institutions? But no, in fact, it came out of this sort of democratic impulse to really have open access, not recreate some kind of uh, the same kind of equity issues that are existing across the board with higher education. So for us, the platinum model is is something that really creates equity in what is, you know, an inequitable landscape of who has access to the many thousands of dollars that it costs to publish a book open access with a lot of university presses. We are about at time and we do have some questions we didn't get to, which I apologize uh, for, but really a wonderful panel and, and great discussion and, and interaction from the, the attendees and the panelists. And I just wanna thank everybody so much. Um, would our panelists like to all leave us with one final thought about open access? Um, I'll start with Beth Fugit. So at seven o'clock this morning, Pacific time, just before this session, I participated in a presentation given by Reggie Regu at the um, uh, University of Cape Town about open access publishing. They've just created a um, platform for open access monographs there. And he has really important ideas about how to make open access relevant to the research agenda in Africa. And I think it's super important for us as we go forward to engage in conversations with um, people like Reggie doing that work. Heather. Um, I wanna give a plug for open infrastructure because this stuff is not cheap, folks. And um, considering each book you know, as an island doesn't really get us to where we want to go because the infrastructure needs, you know, are so great. Um, the, the the presses that have developed the open platforms, you know, that's that's a great start. 
Um, there are collective funding models for a directory of open access books, for example, directory of open access journals, um, that libraries and consortia. In some cases, it's just a couple hundred dollars a year to support these infrastructure projects. So if you're looking for a way to make a difference, um, you know, I strongly, you know, urge uh, look, considering supporting these infrastructure projects. Beth. Yeah, I'll say that uh, at a lot of these panels, and I scrolled through the participants today, I see a lot of press names, I see a lot of library names, and what I'd like to see more of are scholars. And I think it's on us to do a lot of the educating about what options there are for open access, because oftentimes scholars are not given that background, but when they hear about you know, the usage, the impact, what they might get doing a project open access, they're really excited and then they're energized, um, but there just isn't a lot of information out there for them in terms of publishing in general, but also open access in particular. So definitely if, if you're one of the press or library people uh, who have listened to this, please help us get the word out. Great, thank you. And this panel will be available, I think, on virtual AHA um, through the end of the virtual AHA uh, timeframe, um, which I forget exactly how long that is, sorry. And I believe Teresa Schmidt will send out a link to it as well to all of the panelists. So thank you all so much for participating and for being here today. Thank you for moderating. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.